My name is Johanna Wagstaff. I'm a meteorologist and an earth scientist. Every day, I see the effects of climate change through my work. A relentless cycle of extreme weather, terrifying storms, deadly heat domes, wildfires, droughts. But I remain in awe of the natural world and how it finds ways to adapt. And that's what we explore on Planet Wonder. Polar vortex, atmospheric river, heat dome. We know these weather phenomena connected to the jet stream are changing. So that got me wondering, what's going on way up there that makes weather down here so extreme? Speaking of up there, talk to me, Goose. When you think of the jet stream, are you thinking of jets, planes, flying? You're not alone. As a pilot, I love flying. This is my dad and fellow pilot, and the one that got me interested in flying. When I was 12 years old, I joined the Air Cadets and my dad took his first flying lesson. He was inspired by his great uncle and World War II pilot. These days, my dad and I fly together in his 1943 World War II tail dragger an Aronka L3B used by the U.S. Army for observation and liaison, to be exact. And yes, I have to reconcile my carbon footprint with being a private pilot. Carbon credits do help. But it was actually getting my pilot's license as a teenager that I was first introduced to meteorology and eventually climate change. The jet stream is where planes catch a ride in what is essentially the highway in the sky. Okay, not this exact plane. This one does better closer to the ground, but it's that very view of the meandering rivers down below as we navigate the winds and the weather around us that has me thinking about the similarities between what's happening above our heads and below our feet. The same conveyor belt that helps give a boost to the big planes is what carries weather systems around the world. And it's that weather that is coming with greater frequency and intensity because of our warming climate. As a meteorologist, I want to know more about how these conveyor belts are changing. And as a pilot, well, request you permission for a flyby. To learn more about these elusive rivers in the sky, we went from a bird's eye view to a fish eye view and met up with atmospheric scientist Rachel White in the Pitt River, literally in the river. Right where the pit lake empties into the river, a stunning backdrop for bird and weather watchers alike. So we're standing in the pit river. How does the jet stream behave like the river? That's a great analogy for what's going on with the jet stream. And so if we think about rivers, we've got we've got this flow of water going in one direction. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we can think about the, the storms that the jet stream are bringing along, like some of the eddies that we might see in the river. You see that they get advected, they get taken along by the flow of the river. And also, if you think about rivers, you think they, they do meander. You see these loops. They're on a different time scale to what's happening in the jet stream. And so the jet stream is creating these meanders and these loops and they're changing on a time scale of sort of days to weeks. Rather than millennia. Exactly, which is what's happening with the river. But it's sort of that same thing of, you know, you have you have pieces of river joining other bits of river. When we look up in the jet stream, it's not actually at any one point just one smooth jet. You've got all of these little bits of the jet stream, they curve around. Um, And the jet stream is a lot wider than this river is here. And so up in the atmosphere, the jet stream is hundreds of kilometers wide. Um, But you know, some of the, some of the aspects are very similar. Hmm. Do people know this? What can you tell me about the jet stream? The jet stream? (laughs) Of the wind and the sea, like the currents and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't know much, and of course the sun, if it's summertime or winter time, that's all I know. Uh, it's constantly moving, and um, if you really look at the weather and the, the, how nature is, you can pretty much see, kind of gives you a little message about what's coming up. I mean, I know like the oceans move because of like the moon, right? I don't know if like maybe it's the same thing or something close to it. The Earth has not one, not two, but four primary jet streams that circle the globe. Two around the polar regions and two around the mid-latitude regions. And that's because 
The Earth isn't heated evenly. The sun's most direct rays hits the equator, and we get the greatest temperature differences where those primary jet streams form. They can travel between 175 and 400 kilometers per hour, so that's why commercial jets often hitch a ride traveling west to east. Mwah. Okay, Rachel, what's going on way up there that makes weather so extreme down here? Yeah, that's a great question. And whereas when we think about weather extremes, we obviously think about what's happening at the surface because that's what's impacting us. But when scientists and forecasters are sort of looking at this, they're usually actually looking at what's happening up in the atmosphere. And when I say up in the atmosphere, it could be as far as sort of nine kilometers above the surface. Okay, hold that thought. Experiment time. I want to demonstrate to you the two forces that affect the jet stream, the spin of the Earth and the temperature difference around our planet, and show you how that can drive atmospheric rivers using household items, namely a turntable. Make sure you ask your parents before you pour water on their turntable. Always wanted to say that. Uh, and various Tupperware. So this big glass bowl is a proxy for a rotating planet. The water in it is our atmosphere, and this jar of ice is the pole. So you're kind of looking down on Earth from the North Pole. We're gonna get this puppy spinning, low RPM there. And I'm gonna give it a few minutes so that the water spins uniformly unperturbed. Try not to play any music while we're doing this. It'll, it'll just be scratches. Okay, first we're gonna add blue food coloring close to the pole as a proxy for the polar jet stream. Let's see here, just a couple dabs. Now watch as the earth rotates those ribbons of cold air start to extend down towards the equator. And because of the Coriolis effect, which is the deflection of air to the right because of the spin of the Earth, we start to get eddies. And those eddies are actually what our winter storms look like across Canada. Ooh, this is looking good. This is a turbulent planet Earth right now. I love it. I count like four storms. Okay, now we're going to add green food coloring close to the equator, so the edge of the glass. And this is a proxy for our warm air. There we go, a couple drops here. We'll let that start to spin. And what you'll notice is the green, warmer air starts to fill in the gaps between the cold air. You'll start to see those ribbons stretch up from the equator towards the pole. And what this is doing in reality is transporting huge amounts of warm, moist air from the equator poleward. In fact, this is how the west coast of the US and Canada gets most of its water vapor uh, via these huge atmospheric rivers. And that's really what you're looking at. These ribbons are atmospheric rivers that stretch hundreds of kilometers. Now this is a very stormy planet Earth right now, but this is actually an excellent proxy for what's happening right above our heads. And so what's happening up there is really sort of creating the systems, that's where systems are growing and developing that are going to affect the weather down at the surface. And there's different ways that extremes can um, happen and all of them are affected by what the atmosphere is doing really way up. And so, for example, for heat extremes, and so if we're thinking about a heat wave that happens over the summer, usually what's happening is that we have a high pressure system that's sitting sort of over a particular region and it's staying still. And so we call this a blocking high, and it's called blocking because it sort of blocks any other weather systems that might be coming in, and they get diverted around this high pressure system, and then this high pressure just stays over us. And so for cold extremes, actually, it's often a lot more to do with the meanders in the jet stream up above us um, that end up bringing in a lot of um, cold air from uh, the north, essentially. And so when we have a meander, or we have winds coming from the north towards us in the northern hemisphere, this is going to create pretty cold weather here. I, as a meteorologist, I often think of the jet stream as the conveyor belt 
for weather and we look for yeah. blocking patterns like the omega block yes. here in North America. So they really are tied together. Yes, they really are. And exactly that, the, the jet stream is sort of transporting a lot of our weather systems. Okay, hold that thought. It's not only weather and planes that jet streams transport around the world, they'll take any kind of hitchhiker, including smoke and ash. By now, most Canadians have probably been affected in some way by wildfires on the other side of the country. Wildfires in Western Canada and California can get so intense and so large that smoke and particles billow all the way up into the jet stream. From there, they cross the 5,000 kilometers to the east side of the country. Then, when a weather system brings sinking air, it pulls the wildfire particles and chemicals down to ground level, sometimes bringing dangerously poor air quality. It also is often the reason for those eerily red and orange sunsets. That's because the smoke particles allow sunlight's longer wavelength colors, red and orange, to get through while blocking the shorter wavelengths of yellow, blue, and green. So it would make sense that volcanic ash is just as transportable. One of the most recent examples is the major volcano that erupted on the Russian peninsula of Kamchatka, sending ash 10 kilometers straight up into the sky and right into the path of the jet stream. A few days later, that drifting ash prompted flight cancellations across BC and Alaska. Oh, jet stream, you gotta start vetting your passengers.